So I think this is kind of timely because Bob and Jane Takai, Bob and Jane were here a number of years ago, and they were asking all about the people in blues and the people who come into the community and stuff. So today I was going to share something about that. And um, this is something that I do after our ordinations. I give pause and I go back to think about the process that Venerable has sort of formulated here that puts us into the stream of monastic life and how powerful and how important the process is and why it works. And this year, because Venerable now long ordained and have just been so um, cognizant of his journey from exploring monastic life through his Anagarka process and now through novice ordination, I just wanted to share because it re really re-inspires me and it reconfirms the Dharma as a powerful tool of training and transformation. And that we've all been through this for the most part and that the evolution of the training how the pieces of it are like a thread and that they continue on no matter what, what level of training you are. There are commonalities of threads that continue to work through our entire ordained life. So I wanted to start off with basically with EML. These are some of my insights that I personally feel I've garnered. Um, and then also seeing everybody else participating in this process of training. So I think that exploring monastic life that we've done since 2005, I think has grown into an extremely clear, informative, and explorative program that really tests the waters. I mean, that's where we really put our toes into the water. Is this aspiration worth looking into and following? And that the way that Venerable laid this out, I don't see that much variation from the way she has the curriculum now than when she had it 17 years ago. She talks a lot about the Buddhist life. She talks a lot through the sutras about what the Sangha's relationship was to the laity, how the Buddha taught them, how he advised them. Um, she really lays out the Buddha's life and how the first song, the first Sangha actually navigated living in community and, and keeping their precepts. And it helps to connect to the Buddha, that he really is our fundamental teacher. You know, barring anything else, he is our fundamental teacher. And then, of course, she's always put the offering service in there. And to watch people over the years come in to do forest work. And I mean, some people haven't even cleaned toilets before or worked in a kitchen. To see the, the willingness and to see that offering service is so much a part of monastic life, at least in this community, and that it is a, a growing of our qualities and really seeing the, um, the capacity built through serving the three jewels. Then she's had, which has always been one of my favorites, was the group discussions, where she really throws out these really provocative questions to bring, you know, what is our relationship to family, to sex, to money, to authority, to uh, expectations, what things trip us up, what are unresolved things in our life that could become obstacles if we were to proceed into monastic life. So I really feel that the exploring monastic life as I've seen and as I experienced it was, um, is really the first step to, to deep self-assessment. You know, you get to see the inside view of community life, of monastic life, that is not just sitting on a cushion and meditating, but it really is serving the three jewels in a number of ways. So then, you know, then you start to track people, including yourself, that you come back for longer periods of time. You see the community in daily life. You start seeing, you know, when we're not in a program, you can say, well, they're not perfect. <laughs> they're working on their minds and hearts on a lot of different levels. And I think between the exploring monastic life and Anagarka, you, I think it's helpful. The, the program really helps to bring the perception of monastics down to earth. In the early years, one of the things that we found, and we weren't even monastics at that time, is that the lay people yonder had us quite up on a pedestal. And as they interfaced with us and found that we had our own foibles and our own, you know, crazy minds, that they had to go through this reframing what they thought a monastic was. Of course, they had Venerable as the, as the example. So that's, you know, that's easily you could see that she was living the monastic life and really embodying the precepts and the Vinaya. But there was really a coming to terms that monastics are really ordinary people. They're on a particular sort of, you know, path, but they're still dealing with the same stuff that everybody else deals with. But I think during monastic life, there was a little bit in these stays afterwards, honing in on the aspiration 
you know, clarifying, you know, does it, to the point where people were, are willing to rearrange their lives to come here, to say, all right, I think this is still standing, it hasn't gone away, I've thought about it, I've gone back to the Abbey a few times, I'm going to go and stay, and I'm going to request this discernment, because I want to really see, is this standing on solid ground, or is this still more, rom you know, rom romantic thinking and magical thinking? So it was really a part of further discernment that then you step into the Anagarika stage, which is all of our folks in the, in the blue outfits. And I have found, and I remember, I was in gray at the time, and it was only me. It wasn't, I didn't have any buds when I was Anagarika. I was just Venerable Tarpa and Venerable Children and myself. But it was really a pivotal point of discernment. You know, it's like going into deeper into what it is we want in our spiritual journey. What, do, what would it look like if I were to, cons you know, to follow this path? Do I want the Dharma to be my compass in this very specific way? I've got the Dharma in my heart. I feel connected to the community. I feel connected to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. But do I want it to be this specific of a direction in my life? Can I live without so many worldly strings, so many ties to samsara, and be content? I think that's a huge pivotal exploration during Annika, uh, Anagarika time. Can I live in a community? Can I live with people that I maybe wouldn't respond to an ad that said roommate wanted? You know, would I be able to live with such a diversity of, of people with different perspectives, going all in the same direction, but being very, very different? And do I want to become a Buddha? Can my mind take the training in order to grow a happy, wise, compassionate mind, ethical conduct? Am I willing to straighten up my behavior? Am I willing to really, you know, clean up my act? So I think the Anagarika period is so pivotal in just kind of getting, uh, honing in on what it is that we're aspiring for and, you know, what is it actually might look like? I think what, you know, you get to look at what would ordain life, what would it take emotionally, mentally, spiritually, psychologically? We want to draw a correct conclusion after the Anagarika training. And that doesn't mean that ordained life. We've had a few folks go through Anagarika and come out the other side and say, it's clear this is not what I am looking for. I want to go back to school. I want to have a relationship. I want to, you know, use my dharma in different ways in my life. So the clarity is the indication that we've been successful in this discernment period. And I really do believe that it is really important to not hurry through this stage. You know, we've got people around us, inspired, ready to go, and am I ready to go? And, you know, I only had myself to discern, so I didn't have any sort of peer enthusiasm driving my decision. You know, I really was able to kind of just hold steady and, and to make up my mind. And it took nine months for me. My Anagarika period was nine months. But to take our time, it takes what it takes, and not to be pressured by other folks' readiness. So then, you know, that period could take anywhere from six months to 18 months, depending on where you are and what you need. And then you go into novice ordination, which is like a new chapter in our life book. This is a really, this is after much thought and introspection, that monastic life will be the best way for me to progress on the path to awakening, to be of the greatest benefit. And that wearing robes, keeping precepts, shaving my head, living in community, being a white crow, as it is said, might be okay. There is still doubt. There's still going to be resistance to the form. There's still going to be the training. The rock tumbler is like cranking up after novice ordination, or you're more aware of its work on your mind. The self-centered thought is furious because you've decided to ordain, and it's going to be a whole lot more creative and trying to sabotage you, but you see it more clearly, and you, it might have a little bit less free reign than it used to. So this, the, the novice time is just really, once more, honing in, training, um, getting clear, and you're stepping into a stream. You are stepping into a 2,600-year-old beautiful river that is going in a very different direction than the world is going. It is also, from my experience, it challenges, it really started to challenge a lot of my limiting preconceptions about myself, what I can do, what I thought I couldn't do, what I can't live without, but I realized, realized I could live without. That Dharma became a really powerful medicine to begin to cleanse, transform, open, and soften my mind. 
And that was really in the Shikshamana, in the novice time that I really felt that, that the precepts were really trying, were really holding me. And I noticed that more on the inside of me that was holding. This is still, you know, I still had a lot of, what about my practice, my time, my study? There was a lot of my, 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 but a little bit less so. The thoughts were coming around to think about others a little bit more frequently. Um, during that time, I don't know if it's a, it's a shared experience, is that responsibilities changed. We were asked to do things that stretch us, and that we balked at, but we did them and we didn't die. Challenging more limits we have set for ourselves. The, so the practice and the, and the ordination become a watershed for really developing new habits, new virtue, new uh, ways to deal with the resistance and the self-centered thought. I really found the, the novice time to be a real watershed for getting clear about why I was doing what I was doing and to seeing some real um, improvement in my behavior. I noted that where the stubbornness was, where the willingness was starting to grow, where my contentment was starting to really be more noticeable, more evident, and that the Dharma was really beginning to seep in. The precepts were reining me in. The community was helping me open up. And I was getting a little bit more clearer about this whole thing about what to abandon, what to cultivate. You know, the wisdom of the precepts, the wisdom of the Vinaya was trying to give me some clarity on, you know, what do I have to really start not doing? You know, changing the tone of my mind. And what do I want to cultivate? And then right now, because I'm still in this the rest of the lifelong process, full ordination. And Venable always said, you know, until for the, full ordination, she didn't know this whole thing about universal responsibility, about I'm doing this because of my bodhicitta. I'm doing this so I can become a Buddha, so I can be of the greatest benefit. And that you start getting a sense of it's, it is about you still, but it's not all about you. It becomes more about others. And that starts to slowly replace the my practice, my time, my energy, my, 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 becomes a little bit more other, other. What about you? What about you? Um, the self-centered thought is still running, ran, you know, crazy. But we still are, we're now able to have a, a, um, a panacea of medicine. We have uh, more medicines, more tools, because the precepts really start settling things down. Um, life becomes, yeah, we look to strengthen our resolve, to grow our flexibility, our humor, our kindness, our humility, our wisdom. Where am I still stuck? That is a proverbial question that I considered, continue to ask myself after, you know, it's been 12 years of full ordination, where am I still stuck? Where are these old mental habits that I haven't been able to break? How does getting advice land now? Am I still as descent, d defensive? Am I still as stubborn? Am I still caving into my shame and self-criticism? So full ordination, the whole bodhicitta, and just being part of this beautiful lineage starts to really settle in as a reality, that you're holding something really precious. Um, the responsibilities increase, ready or not. You offer yourself more. You're asked to do more. But your practice begins to start. The, the ups and downs aren't so extreme. The joy comes a little bit with less effort. The stop complaining already is still there. Um, and then you see the wisdom of the community that really supports you in this ordination as well. Um, and that there's still a lot to do, there's still a lot to understand, there's still a lot to train, but there's something beautiful about this stage in monastic life where the, the honing, the clarifying, the strengthening, the wisdom, the bodhicitta really come into play in a much more specific way. So I could say a lot more about this, but I wanted, because of Nawang's ordination, really kind of re-inspired me to, to, to look at the full brilliance of Venerable's how she set this up, and that we've all been through it for the most part in some aspect or another, and that it really has served this community well and is serving the Three Jewels well. And I really wanted to celebrate that from my own side by really sharing what I've understood about this process. Thank you.